Welcome, everyone. Um, Dr. Cheryl Shaw is our speaker today, and she is a veterinarian with 30 years of ex professional experience, including 12 years of private practice in food animal medicine and 20 years with USDA, including Food Safety Inspection Service, FSIS, in field operations and headquarters in the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APH, APHIS, in veterinary services. As an epidemiologist, area veterinarian in charge, and export service center director. Dr. Shaw holds a doctor of veterinary medicine from Washington State University and a master's of public health from the University of Minnesota. She's a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Preventative Medicine and a senior executive fellow from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. In 2017, she was named the Daniel E. Solomon Award recipient for outstanding contributions and notable service in the public's interest by a veterinarian federally employed in any human health, environmental health, or animal health discipline. Dr. Shaw currently serves as the Director of Applied Epidemiology Staff within the Office of Public Health Science, FSIS, in Washington, D.C. I'd like to thank you for attending and welcome Dr. Shaw. All right. Thank you, Suzanne and Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting me to speak today. I am Dr. Sherry Shaw, as Suzanne said, Director of the Applied Epidemiology Staff at the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service. For those of you that are studying for the exam next year, I hope some of this information will uh, help you study for that exam. And for everybody else, just hope you enjoy the show. All right, psittacosis or parrot fever in humans is a rare yet notifiable condition in the United States, historically associated with parrots. 60 human cases were reported between 2008 and 2017 in the United States. And two early outbreaks were associated with turkeys in 1940 and 1989. The prevalence in U.S. poultry is unknown and is assumed to be relatively low. However, the unpredictability and potentially high infectiousness among poultry and serious symptoms among workers makes this a disease worth knowing about and watching for. This presentation will cover acidicosis outbreak in 2018 involving 80 workers at two slaughter chicken facilities and the One Health approach used by state and federal partners to investigate the outbreak. One Health is a collaborative, multi-sectoral, and transdisciplinary approach, working at the local, regional, national, and global levels with a goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnectedness between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. In this presentation, it is my hope that you will learn more about psittacosis in poultry and humans and the goals, roles, and responsibilities of state and federal agencies in a One Health response and investigation. This outbreak of psittacosis in a food production environment embodies the recognition of the interconnectedness of humans, animals, and their shared environment. This afternoon, I will introduce you to the agency I work for, the Food Safety and Inspection Service, provi provide a brief background on psittacosis, then dive into the 2018 outbreak and the One Health approach used to investigate it, including some lessons learned and recommendations. So let's get started by introducing you to FSIS, the Public Health Regulatory Agency of the United States Department of Agriculture. The Food Safety and Inspection Service is responsible for ensuring that meat, poultry, and egg products are safe and that they are properly labeled and packaged. It's important to note that FSIS does not have authority over plant worker safety and that psittacosis is not a food safety hazard. You can see on the slide the presence of FSIS across the country, keeping our meat and poultry products safe. FSIS ensures that public health requirements are met as each year FSIS staff inspect 166 million head of livestock, 9.7 billion poultry carcasses, and 2.5 billion pounds of liquid, frozen, and dried egg products. FSIS is governed by and receives authority from the five acts listed on the slide. Anybody studying for the exam 
You might want to look closely at that slide. Those are some great questions there. You can find a one-stop shop for federal food safety information at foodsafety.gov. If you're a hardcore Jeopardy fan, you might remember December 2019 episode, which featured this question. Psittacosis, aka this bird fever, can also spread to people from ducks and pigeons. If your response was, what is parrot fever? And congratulations for knowing your stuff. Jeopardy didn't list, list chickens and turkeys as potential transmission sources to humans. Psittacosis is infrequently reported in poultry plant workers. However, there have been documented outbreaks in the United States going back to 1948 when illnesses were identified among workers in a turkey slaughter plant. Another outbreak occurred in 1989 that was also linked to turkeys. In birds, the disease is usually called psittacosis when associated with psittacine birds and ornithosis in other birds such as poultry. Avian chlamydiosis is a systemic bacterial infection caused by chlamydia psittaceae. Diagnosis is achieved using serology, culture, and or PCR. That's another good test question. Treatment is with antibiotics such as tetracyclines. Clinical presentations range, ranged from inapparent subclinical infection to acute, subacute, or chronic disease of wild and domestic birds characterized by respiratory, digestive, or systemic infection. Infections occur worldwide and have been identified in at least 465 avian species, particularly caged birds, primarily citizens, colonial nesting birds, such as egrets or herons, radites, raptors, and poultry. Among domestic species, turkeys, ducks, and pigeons are most often affected. The disease is a significant cause of economic loss and human exposure in many parts of the world. Psittacosis in humans is a nationally notifiable disease. The most common source of infection is thought to be pet psittacine birds. Psittacosis in humans results from inhalation of aerosolized droppings or respiratory secretions from birds infected with chlamydia psittacea and is typically a mild respiratory illness with nonspecific symptoms, including fever, headache, chills, muscle ache, and cough. Has an incubation period of one to four weeks and severe illness and death are extremely rare at less than 1%. Overall, psittacosis is rare in the United States. As I said, only 60 cases reported during the years 2008 through 2017. Psittacosis is rarely documented in poultry plant workers, and the last large outbreak in 1989 was linked to turkeys. The prevalence in U.S. poultry is unknown and is assumed to be relatively low. The line in this graph is dashed because available diagnostic tests and the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, or NNDSSS, case definition has changed over time. So it's not really an apple-to-apple -apple comparison by year. We only have records on the case definition since 1990, and even since then, the case definition has changed. CDC conducts case surveillance through the NNDSS. In the case surveillance process, about 3,000 health departments gather and use data on disease cases to protect their local communities. Through NNDSS, CDC receives and uses these data to keep people healthy, and defend America from health threats. Numerous CDC programs collaborate with the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists, CSTE, to determine which conditions reported to local, state, and territorial public health departments are nationally notifiable. CSTE brings together disease and surveillance experts at CDC and in the health departments to determine what types of data should be included in national notifications. NNDSS receives, processes, and provides data on nationally notifiable diseases to programs across CDC. These programs use this data to recognize disease outbreaks, track the spread of disease at the state, 
regional, and national levels. Identify geographic areas of concern and inform state decision makers. They help state and local public health departments better control disease by identifying groups most at risk and evaluate and fund disease control activities. The mission of NNDSS is to advocate for changes that empower and strengthen our children, families, and communities by providing quality, holistic, culture, and value-based services. You can visit their website shown here on the slide to learn more about case surveillance and see a comparison of reportable versus notifiable diseases in humans. Here are some things you should know about avian chlamydiosis. Avian chlamydiosis is a systemic bacterial infection caused by chlamydia cidice, an obligate intracellular bacterium with eight recognized avian serotypes. Six of these infect avian species and are distinct from mammalian chlamydia serotypes. Strains of C. cidice are classified using genetic differences in the outer membrane protein, or OMP, a gene into nine genotypes. Seven of these are found in avian species and usually correspond to the equivalent serotype. The chart on the slide shows the association between avian genotypes of chlamydia cidice and types of birds. The 2018 outbreak was due to type D. In the outbreak that occurred in 2018, occupational exposure to chicken was the risk factor of concern. Workers at two chicken facilities became ill with respiratory symptoms consistent with psittacosis. In September of 2018, FSIS's Office of Field Operations was notified by public health agencies of human cases of psittacosis in two spent hand slaughter facilities. Signs of illness in humans included fever, headache, chills, muscle aches, and cough. Some patients were diagnosed with pneumonia and some were hospitalized. Most illnesses were identified in employees in the evisceration section of the plants. Operations at both plants paused until thorough cleaning and disinfection was completed. Environmental sampling showed no evidence of chlamydia cidice after cleaning and disinfection. FSIs worked closely with animal health and public health partners to identify potential sources of the birds with psittacosis and recommend safeguards to prevent further introduction of birds into slaughter facilities, which may be shedding C. cidice. Overall, from August through October of 2018, a total of 80 illnesses were reported to public health authorities that were either suspected or confirmed for psittacosis. Of those 80 illnesses, 29 required hospitalization and 43 had pneumonia. 13 cases were laboratory confirmed. CDC coordinated with state public health officials in investigating the human illnesses. A case was defined as illness in a worker employed during August 1 through September 7, 2018 at the Virginia plant or during August 13th to September 28, 2018 at the Georgia plant with either physician diagnosed pneumonia or fever or chills with two or more symptoms of headache, cough, or muscle aches. A confirmed case required PCR detection of C. cidice in a clinical specimen. To recap, psittacosis in humans results from inhalation of aerosolized droppings or respiratory secretions from birds infected with chlamydia cidice. The dotted line is the estimated trend line. There are many caveats, including identification of a new chlamydia species in 1989 that may have previously been captured as C. cidice. And the case definition changed over time. In the end, the reported number of cases to NNDSS for 2018 was 22. So the spike was not as large as the projected number shown on the graph. It was because many of the 80 cases identified through the outbreak case definition did not meet the current NNDSSS DSS case definition. This highlights the potential differences between outbreak case definitions and surveillance case definitions. This outbreak of psittacosis in a food production environment truly does embody the recognition of the interconnectedness of humans, animals, and their shared environment. The response to this outbreak included health professionals from local, state, and federal sectors. Human health agencies 
included state health departments, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Respiratory Division, and CDC National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH. These partners focused on site visits to the affected facilities, identified human cases, conducted risk assessments, coordinated the laboratory testing, and coordinated the overall communication. At the establishments, plant management and FSIS staff evaluated whether a food safety hazard existed. They participated in a health hazard evaluation, both at the plant by NIOSH and at FSIS headquarters by convening a health hazard evaluation board or HHEB. At the plant, birds were inspected ante and post-mortem for evidence of psychosis. Flock health screening questionnaires were reviewed. Data was analyzed regarding the suppliers and FSIS partnered with USDA APHIS and state animal health officials or SAHOs. The establishments also conducted town halls to identify cases and share preventive measures. USDA APHIS veterinary services staff worked closely with the state animal health officials to evaluate the criteria for tracing source flocks. They created and implemented a questionnaire for potential risk flocks factors in the flocks of origin and shared recommendations for continued surveillance and prevention. Let's focus on the people aspect of One Health and the agencies that focus on human health. At the CDC, the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, or NCIRD, was critical in coordinating the overall investigation. The mission of NCIRD is to the prevention of disease, disability, and death through immunization and by control of respiratory and related diseases. These epi curves show the illnesses in persons working at either the Virginia or the Georgia plant during the specified period. The two processing plants are owned by the same company and process spent broiler breeder flocks, which are birds at the end of their reproduction cycle. In total, there were 80 human cases of psittacosis in this outbreak, 13 were laboratory confirmed by RT-PCR. 50 cases were identified and five confirmed at the Virginia plant. 30 cases were identified and eight confirmed at the Georgia plant. Isolates obtained from confirmed cases were determined to be type D, as I mentioned earlier, which is the most often found in poultry. In addition to the size of this outbreak, another troubling and unique feature was the severity of illness. Previously, I mentioned that less than 1% of cases experienced severe illness or death. Thankfully, there were no deaths, but a total of 29 workers or 36% were hospitalized, three in intensive care with stays ranging from one to 37 days. The difference in probable, suspect, and confirmed cases is likely because C. citacy is notoriously difficult to definitively diagnose an outbreak investigation diagnostic challenge. You can read more about this investigation in an emerging infectious disease article published in 2019. The link is here on the page on the screen. NIOSH or the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health was created by the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. NIOSH was established as a separate an independent research program to create objective scientific research findings in the field of occupational safety and health. The mission of NIOSH is to develop new knowledge in the field of occupational safety and health and to transfer that knowledge into practice. Let's focus on the environmental aspect of One Health. Both plant management and FSIS have employees and responsibilities in the environment where this outbreak occurred. Environmental testing occurred in the live bird areas, organic matter reservoirs, ventilation sites, and drain sites. Plant employees followed routine plant cleaning protocols and used disinfectants with a pH of less than three on the surfaces. FSIS conducted routine sanitation inspections. As I mentioned earlier, FSIS does not have authority over plant worker safety, that's an OSHA issue but FSIS does have authority over inspector safety and therefore requested an on-site health hazard evaluation from NIOSH for the FSIS workers. Within FSIS, a health hazard evaluation board 
or HHEB, is used to evaluate the public health risk of potential human health hazards associated with meat, poultry, or egg products. HHEBs are convened on an ad hoc basis for acute events that must be resolved in a limited amount of time and address situations involving potential human health hazards when the agency is uncertain about the nature or severity of the human health risk and needs additional information to inform its response. The HHEB reviews available scientific information to assess the associated public health risk and inform agency decisions. The HHEB does not decide what action the agency should take in response to a potential hazard and is not convened to address situations that can be resolved by applying existing laws, regulations, or policies. NIOSH conducted a HHE or health hazard evaluation for worker safety at the request of USDA. NIOSH recommended repositioning the cooling fans, ensuring that the evisceration tools were all working properly, and made changes to other work practices to reduce bacterial contamination and aerosolization. The FSIS HHEB found that the Chlamydia cidice did not present a significant food safety risk due to minimal likelihood of exposure through food. The HHEB recommended cleaning and disinfection with quaternary ammonium or bleach, followed by environmental testing. It also recommended that FSIS partner with APHIS to evaluate pre-harvest mitigations to eliminate exposure and create a pre-harvest questionnaire to provide to plant management. Environmental samples were collected before and after cleaning and disinfection and tested for the presence of chlamydia species. Positive samples were detected prior to CND, but after cleaning and disinfection, no chlamydia cidice were detected. The pre-harvest questionnaire developed by the HHEB included questions about flock biosecurity, flock mortality, respiratory signs, air sacculitis, and any diagnoses of chlamydia. Completed questionnaires were signed by the flock veterinarian and sent with each flock to slaughter. During and after the investigation, workers were protected from further exposure via, via implementation of elimination controls, which included the flock certifications completed for all incoming flocks and verified by plant personnel, engineering controls, which was which included adjusting the fans to not blow directly into the faces of the staff, and thirdly, personal protective equipment, including face shields, frocks, and gloves. Finally, let's focus on the animal aspect of One Health. The poultry company specialized in processing spent chickens, chickens that have met their lifespan for laying eggs. There are only a few other plants in the country that specialize in processing these older birds. The FSIS chief scientist and applied epidemiology staff reviewed the plant supplier records and then contacted APHIS to request a pre-harvest evaluation of potential source flocks. APHIS works in a variety of ways to protect and improve the health, quality, and marketability of our nation's animals, animal products, and veterinary biologics. APHIS Veterinary Services works routinely with livestock and poultry suppliers on animal disease detection and control. The APHIS VS Deputy Administrator serves as the Chief Veterinary Officer of the United States. On the next slide, I'll show you the great work done by APHIS in tracing the supplier flocks. The animal health investigation included joint effort between FSIS, APHIS, and SAHOS. We received really good cooperation from plant management who spent a lot of time explaining their business model including the catch and transportation phases to help identify potential risks in those areas. The poultry processing plant receives flocks from 23 integrators covering a wide geographic region, essentially everything east of the Mississippi River. They're unique because they are handling spent hens. The processor that owns both plants contracts a catching crew and the trucking. Integrators call the processor to let them know birds are ready to pick up. Around 4,000 birds are on a single truck. They go to either the Virginia or the Georgia plant, depending on the proximity to the plant, scheduling, and the size of the farms. For the flock traceback, FSIS and APHIS reviewed dates of illness onset and the timing of shipments. They initially identified 12 flocks or farms of interest, one in Tennessee, 
the rest in North Carolina. The North Carolina Department of Ag Director of Poultry Programs worked with APHIS to further refine this list by restricting inclusion to those with flocks processed at both plants with dates of processing within known human incubation periods. And they looked at increased dead on arrival and condemnations for reasons that would be consistent with CCDC. This narrowed the number of North Carolina farms of interest to six. APHIS developed a farm survey and piloted it with the flock in Tennessee. Based on that experience, they refined it for use with the six North Carolina flocks. The North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Resources developed a matrix of criteria to score farms for the risk of CCDC. The first criteria determined the time from human cases to processing of the flock, recognizing an incubation period in humans of five to 14 days. One point was given if the farms processed were possibly consistent with or consistent with the timing of the human cases. The second criteria evaluated condemnations and dead on arrivals or DOAs from the processed flocks. One point was given if the farms processed were over 5.05% condemnations plus dead on arrivals based on the total head submitted. The third criteria evaluated air sacculitis and septicemia rates from the processed flocks. One point was given if farms had a 0.5% or greater amount of overall air sacculitis plus septicemia condemnation rates. If a farm scored zero or one, it was given a green designation as low likelihood to be a farm of interest for traceback. A score of two points was given a yellow designation as moderate likelihood to be a farm of interest for traceback. And a score of three points was given a designation of high likelihood to be a farm of interest for traceback. Seven farms completed the survey addressing biosecurity and flock health. In four of six farms, wild birds were routinely seen outside of the buildings. In one of the six farms, wild birds were inside the houses during the flock. Four of six farms cleaned up spilled grain the same day it was spilled. Six farms have a written biosecurity plan and five of them actively train employees on the plan. Three farms reported increased mortality, although none reported increases in respiratory disease. Of interest was that three of the flocks were spiked with male birds, meaning new birds were added within 12 weeks of processing. Syndromic surveillance did not detect any respiratory illness patterns in humans in the areas where the birds were raised. Among poultry workers, no respiratory symptoms or illnesses were reported in 21 full-time, 17 part-time, and 17 contract workers between July 1 and September 1 of 2018. Due to the expected low prevalence of avian chlamydiosis in the United States, testing every broiler breeder flock prior to processing could result in a low positive predictive value and increased costs of testing. False positives could result in unintended negative consequences, both for the individual producers and for the U.S. poultry industry including direct and indirect costs and impacts from lost international trade markets. Intensive testing may also place an undue strain on diagnostic capacity. That said, there is a potential that this disease is more common than we realize, and we are not detecting it because of the nonspecific symptoms, the mild presentation in humans, the lack of awareness among healthcare providers, and lack of surveillance. To strengthen safeguards, a potential strategy for targeted surveillance includes closer examination of flocks with increased mortality or respiratory disease. This would include identifying flocks experiencing an increase in mortality 1.75 times above the expected rate during the last four weeks before processing, and then performing a necropsy on a representative sample of birds to try to determine a cause. Necropsy should be conducted by an individual knowledgeable of poultry diseases and their pathology in a well-ventilated area away from live birds. Alternatively, birds could be submitted to the state's veterinary diagnostic laboratory. The elevated mortality seems attributable to a bacterial septicemia or respiratory disease, such as pneumonia or air sacculitis. Then diagnostic samples should be collected to rule out common bacterial pathogens, such as E. coli, Salmonella and Pasteurella. 
If the necropsy results are highly suggestive of C. cidisi, or if results for common bacterial pathogens are inconclusive, negative, or inconsistent with the necropsy results, then samples should be tested for C. cidisi. So what have we learned today? Here are some takeaways that I hope help. Psittacosis is a rare yet significant human health risk in processing plant workers. While psittacosis appears to be very rare in chickens and turkeys and does not present a food safety concern, poultry plant employers should be aware of this potential occupational hazard. Involvement of two chicken establishments belonging to the same parent company suggests a common upstream source. The two affected establishments located in Virginia and Georgia slaughtered and processed spent broiler hens. Since worker illnesses occurred over a short period of time, it's highly likely both establishments received birds originating from the same flock. Investigation into this outbreak is a textbook example of One Health in action. Multiple federal and state partners played a role in the response to this outbreak. CDC worked with state public health agencies to address aspects related to human illnesses, including environmental testing in the facility, recommendations for cleaning and disinfection, and a health hazard evaluation by NIOSH. FSIS worked with plant management to address FSIS worker safety issues in plant and assisted APHIS in identifying records that could potentially support on-farm investigations. APHIS partnered with state animal health officials to investigate potential sources and risk factors associated with poultry farms that supplied chickens to these establishments. You can learn more about this investigation on the CDC website listed on the slide. So our recommendations, they include strengthening biosecurity and targeted surveillance, pretty much the cornerstones of keeping our poultry safe. Producers may consider mitigations against breeder infection with chlamydia and identify infections when possible. Implementing biosecurity practices surrounding wild birds, cleaning up spilled feed immediately, developing biosecurity plans and training on them, and limiting worker contact with pet birds can all help. Targeted surveillance during the last four weeks before processing may provide information that could prevent exposure of slaughter plant workers to this pathogen. You can find more recommendations on the CDC website on how poultry plant employers and workers can minimize exposure risks. Thank you a lot for joining me today and I hope my objectives have been met by the presentation. And for those of you taking the exam next year, best of luck. And lastly, I could not have done this without Tracy Dutcher, Miwaka Kobayashi and Michael Martin of APHIS, CDC and North Carolina. Many of the slides are uh, from them and reviewed by them. So I want to send out a great big giant thank you to all of them. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Great, Dr. Shaw. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Toring again. Um, we've got several questions in the Q&A. And what I'd like to do is uh, Stop go ahead and call on individuals who have typed a question. I will activate their microphone and allow them to uh, ask the question live. So with the questions, um, I'm going to start off with uh, the first posting. And that is from an individual that really didn't ask a question, but had a comment. And I think it really speaks to the one health aspect of, of your, your discussion, Dr. Shaw. Individual says, back about 20 years ago, I had a client with an aviary of Lady Goldian finches with chlamydia. The owner had respiratory illness and the daughter ended up with meningitis. I reported it to the Department of Health, but they didn't think the meningitis was from the chlamydia, even though the timing was correct. I was unable to get them to listen to me. It took them three weeks to get them to, res to respond to treatment or the individual that had the, the uh, meningitis to respond to treatment. So again, I think it speaks to the veterinarian's role in, in One Health and, and coordinating with the uh, uh, state officials and, and human health care. So uh, first question I'm gonna have is uh, Dr. Stephanie Harris. Could you ask your question, Dr. Harris? Thank you. Um, I just had a question about uh, the accuracy or precision of the PCR test in, in I guess, in poultry and in, and in humans. 
Thanks. That's a great question. It's an important one for when we're looking at you know sensitivity and specificity. And I'm sorry, I didn't look uh, look up that information, so I don't have it for you. So sorry about that. Great. Second question is about uh, PPE. Uh, Dr. Peggy Carter. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Carter. Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, first I would say, Dr. Shaw, that was a really nice uh, presentation. I particularly like the way you structured it. So great job. Um, and my question is about, uh, as Eric said, uh, PPE. Um, you know, I believe they've shown that face shields are relatively ineffective compared to masks for COVID protection. And I just wondered whether there's been similar testing to see the effectiveness of face shields versus other worker protection like um, masks or air circulation. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Great question. Absolutely. And that is why we started with the, the pyramid of controls with the elimination to try to prevent birds coming in after been cleaning and disinfection. And then the um, setting up the fans so that they weren't blowing directly into their faces. As I mentioned, most of the illnesses were around the evisceration section. And of course, that's where the lungs and air sacs are pulled out of the birds. And so you can imagine some local splash there. We made sure that the face shields came down to the level of the chin. And by helping to direct that exposure, that blocked most of that exposure combined with the engineering controls and the elimination controls. At that point, uh, this was 2018, we had not looked at face masks at all, but the shields did appear to give the best protection, both for the eyes as well as inhalation. Okay, great, thank you. And another question came in with uh, regard to PPE. Might masks of the kind used for concurrent COVID-19 prevention measures also prevent much of the workplace environmental transmission of C. cytosine? Or does it take all the measures mentioned, face shields, et cetera, to accomplish much? It, at the time that we did this investigation, as I said, we didn't, weren't working with masks at that time. And so the combination of you know, prim primarily eliminating birds coming in with that engineering and the PPE did seem to be affected. We did not have any cases after that point in time. So I really can't speak to any other like masks because we didn't use those at that time. Next individual uh, had texted me and said that she did not have access to her microphone. So I'll ask her questions. She had said, said two questions. Why were spent hen farms bringing spiked males into the farm? Any, any so these were, they were, they were spent at the day they went to slaughter, but in the weeks prior to that, they were still laying eggs. So they would have been brought in fresh roosters uh, for the purpose of laying, laying eggs. And I don't know what the cause for the older roosters, you know, why if they took some out and brought in new ones. But we thought that that was interesting because looking at biosecurity, you're looking for potential sources coming in. And so it was noted that three of them did bring in new birds in the period prior to slaughter. Okay. And the second part of uh, that individual's question is, uh, were any FSIS inspectors affected with illness or only the plant employees? So information about, you know, case patients, not really free to share, just there was 80 total. And um, I don't have much more information on the distribution of who they were. Uh, have any efforts been made locally to aid in more rapid recognition of this disease by human health providers? Great question. And CDC with their websites that they've put out, you know, local information, webinars such as this one, uh, the, locally within North Carolina and Tennessee, Virginia and Georgia, obviously public health was involved there. And so some of that local conversation, I don't work in any of those states, so I wasn't privy to any stuff that may have gone straight to them. But we have tried, especially with the CDC website and the articles published in Emerging Infectious Diseases, the other guidance that was on there. Hopefully we have got this information out. And it's if somebody were to Google uh, psittacosis, these references should pop up and be handy information. All right. I would like to call on Dr. Mohammed. And I'm going to hopefully get this name right. Dr. Mohammed Obadite. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Corin, for the call. And thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I am from Jordan. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how we explain the findings that none of the employees at the chicken farms 
we are not infected. Uh, however, eight slaughterhouse workers were infected. Uh, does that relate to exposure? Uh, I, I know that a short uh, time of exposure will lead uh, to infection with uh, cytotoxins. Uh, so how we can explain uh, these findings? Uh, thank you. Great question, and thank you for asking that. And that is the, the uh, epidemiologist question. We look at that in exposures, and there's multiple possibilities. You know, the when you think about the slaughter plant at that end of it, the birds, there's somewhat stress involved with, with the catching process, with the trucking process, with the hauling process, and then the workers are exposed as the viscera is removed, the air sacs and lungs. So potential there was more exposure there than on the farm. I don't know what human levels of immunity are if you know, some of the farm workers may have had mild cases or non-reported cases. There, there just wasn't anything significant reported. So that was part of the reason too that we weren't able to identify a single farm. And you know, we narrowed it down to some that we looked at. Obviously by the time we were doing on-farm investigations, the flocks had emptied, been gone. And so there were no birds there to check out. But that was a, it's a really good question and a great observation, important to the overall story. Thank you. Dr. Courier, Dr. Russell Courier. Um, so I'm going to uh, read the question, uh, what he posted. Uh, Dr. Courier investigated a multi-state outbreak uh, that represents the 1974 spike in your graph. Uh, we did have one death in Nebraska in a worker. We saw a great deal of pericarditis in turkeys and affected birds. Did you also see this in these chickens? All right, thank you for that question. We took, we looked at the condemned codes from FSIS after they had been processed, whether it was dead on arrival, septicemia, air sacculitis. Those were the flocks that were the highest in those levels are the ones that we flagged for follow-up. So they didn't, didn't draw out pericarditis. That would have been one of the condemned codes. It's something we can go back and look at, but it wasn't one of our triggers. We wanted to focus our efforts. You can imagine over that period of time in two very, very busy plants, there was a lot of flocks went through there. And so we really did try to focus in on those that fit the, the air sacculitis. So I'm not sure on the pericarditis exact numbers for you. And that's unfortunate on the death. I... Dr. Marguerite P. Yeah, hi. Yeah, this is my last name's uh, Papuano and several on the call. I, I know a lot of people, I think. Uh, really nice presentation. And just real briefly, you know, I until I retired five years ago, I was the CDC liaison to FDA and FSIS on food safety. So it's really nice to connect back. Um, my question is, um, and it kind of follows on, on Dr. Peggy Carter's comment, you know, when you look at what's happened with this outbreak, where it's happening, the route of exposure, and, um, you know, looking at PPE and how one can protect people, and then you look at more recent examples of what happened with the COVID-19 situation in processing plants and the conditions in the facilities that led to incredible transmission. We know that OSHA really is the regulatory agency to, uh, to take action to pr provide a healthy and safe working environment for employees in these facilities. So we know NIOSH provides surveillance and data, but it's OSHA that can take action to actually uh, implement protective uh, equipment and practices. Was OSHA alerted or briefed or involved in any way with what was happening with this and the similarities with what's happening with uh, COVID-19 exposures? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Hi, Marguerite. Haven't seen you in a few years. I uh, know. Hi. <laughs> it's good to see you again. So regarding the Chlamydia Citizy, of course, our previous outbreaks were in 1948 and 1989, you know, and then this was 2018. So it's kind of like, is that every you know, 20 or 30 years? We did, you know, NIOSH was in there. I don't, 
I don't recall offhand, you know, the, the OSHA involvement in that, but I think as far as the worker safety and worker protection at that time, you know, this was a, it was uh, rapidly noted by public health. They immediately notified FSIS as the regulatory agency in the facility. And we worked with NIOSH and, and worked really close with CDC. They took the, the lead on the human health side of it. So it did ramp down pretty quick. I'm not really in a position to talk about COVID at all. Sorry, I need to, to punt well, yeah, on that one. It, it's trying lessons learned, you know, when you see these themes, it's respiratory pathogens in a close environment, uh, you know, where you mentioned there were plexiglass and, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the recommendations are the same for how do you minimize exposures and, you know, chlamydia alone, a rare event that it is, not so much, but right on, right preceding what then happened in a big way, it would seem that, you know, connecting the dots that OSHA really would be the right agency. CDC is not, re- as we know, CDC is not regulatory. They even, uh, you know, the what happened with COVID and their whole, what happened with their, the EIS investigation and the letter that they wrote and, you know, all the problems that ensued there. NIOSH, again, is data, right? And very important, but OSHA is really the point of action to actually uh, provide regulations to protect human workers. So I would just hope somehow that somebody's connecting these dots and saying, you know, isn't there uh, a bigger lesson here that can be applied to protecting uh, workers in these facilities? So this is more of a comment, a really nice presentation. Thanks so much again. Thanks, Marguerite. Do you have, do you have time for just a couple more, Dr. Shaw? I do, I do. Okay, we got two more. Um, uh, Dr. S. Miller. Okay, I figured out how high is Susan Miller. Thank you very much. This is a disease that we ought not forget. Do you think any conclusions can be drawn for what we call backyard flocks? You know, normally we think these birds are probably at higher risk of exposure to a variety of things uh, compared to an indoor U.S. commercial flock. But do you think there are conclusions that can be drawn for backyard flocks and the people who handle them? Absolutely. Absolutely. And those are the, the foundational, you know, biosecurity and... Um, early diagnosis or testing. So for backyard flocks, of course, we've got the risk of indoor if there are citizen birds in the house. A lot of people have a a pet parrot as well as their backyard chickens. And so thinking about biosecurity, not only from wild birds, but from other types of birds. And then awareness and, you know, if there is an illness going on, working with their veterinarian, if if there's human illnesses with the physician and, and trying to make that connection I think veterinarians are well-trained on zoonotic diseases. And of course I'm biased because I am one, (laughs) but I think the communication and this whole one health approach of when zoonotic diseases affect different groups of animals and when humans potentially get affected by it, that we do need to have that open communication. And I love the resources from CDC. You know, they just do a fantastic job of putting out information for the human side of things and reaching out to the physician. So I think in modern days, One Health has become a huge topic. Uh, zoonotic diseases are being heard more and more outside the veterinary profession. And so that communication helps, but biosecurity, everybody with a backyard flock, flock should know about biosecurity and when to call their veterinarian with a question. And one final question, uh, Dr. Yasser Mahmoud. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear, hear you. you. Yeah, good. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. This is a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I just have a quick uh, uh, question. Uh, you know, uh, chlamydia, uh, uh, you know, the, ch- the changing of the term chlamydia. I hear that it, the name, the scientific name has now been changed into uh, chl- chlamydophilia. Is that correct? Is this is a final uh, approved uh, scientific term for chlamydia plus, as a taxonomy or as a classification? When I uh, was preparing this, I looked that up and I saw that same term that it had changed. 
And I, I thought, should I go back and change everything in my presentation? But my presentation was based on the, the 2018, so I used the terminology from then. But I did see that online that there had been a name change to chlamydophilia, and I, I don't know how permanent that is, but I did see that. Okay, thank you. And I, I do see a comment that, it, that that name may have since been rejected, so I don't know. It, it's out there in the, the web. So, so do, you, do you think that we should uh, stick to Climedia for now or because I, I have a project work on, on work on Climedia nowadays, Climedia Abortus. So I'm, I'm a little bit hesitated. Should I stick to Climedia or move to Climediophilia? I think it's whoever your audience that you're working with, you know, the, the frame in which you're working. And I don't know if that term was for just the, the citizen and the avian Climedia because the, the human chlamydia is a totally separate thing. They, they want me to make sure I made that shirt clear in this presentation too, that this has nothing to do with the mammalian chlamydia. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. That's pretty much all the questions. So uh, I want to thank Dr. Dr. Shaw. I'm going to turn it over real quick here to Dr. Tomasi. Thanks. Um, thank you everyone for attending. And I'm Hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. And um, I've got to give out my last shout out again for uh, CE speakers. Um, we are continuing to try to do this for once a month. And um, we are we have speakers lined up until December or through December. So starting January 2022, we are looking for speakers again. So if you are interested or would like a certain topic, um, please reach out to your uh, organization organizer or to Dr. Turing uh, at the ACBPM website so we can find a speaker on that topic or contact the person that you would like to hear speak or you yourself. Thank you very much, everyone.